my presence here today is unlikely. As a child, I suffered from devastating, debilitating speech anxiety and a speech defect. Overcoming my malady and claiming my voice came once I realized I had something to say. And once I realized the power of voice for everyone, not just myself. Inspired by radical models of how to utilize voice, I developed a civic and academic identity. Over 30 years of research into public discourse and communities culminated and continues in an innovative experiment in civic education, a semester-long foundational practicum in public advocacy and civic engagement. Through this experience with mostly first-year students, I've come to understand how we find our civic voices and how we can best utilize those in our communities. Exploring this topic that is most dear to me and so important to our democratic experience requires that we first understand that connection between voice and democracy, and then we can understand how we can find our own voices and use them to create responsive and resilient communities. In the late 18th century, through cantankerous debates, in times that were much more dangerous and precipitous than our own, that demanded immediacy of decisions and efficiency, the founders of modern democracy created a modern democracy, one in which they won a war against all odds, maintained a union of 13 dissimilar and un unequal colonies, brought together disparate views and moved them forward, and created a model that serves still as an ideal for the world. They could have chosen the easy way. They could have found their own king. And it may have even worked for a while. Instead, they chose a path that was difficult, untried, and enlightened. They believed in the power of human beings to reason, to come together, and develop the best decisions for a community at any given time. Democracy, wherever you find it, is founded in protest. And it's only through protest that we've ever gotten any rights. No rights have ever been granted freely. In 1848, women first petitioned for the right to vote. They didn't get it till 72 years later. And only one woman, who was a small girl at that time, survived the 72 years of constant struggle to cast a vote in the 1920 presidential election. The 15th Amendment guaranteed African American males the right to vote, but they really didn't get that right until 100 years later when Congress finally passed a law to ensure that right. These are just two examples of people who were denied voice and claimed it against devastating obstacles. From them, we can find uh, inspiration and also a model for how we must use our voices to ensure and maintain democracy and communities. The last 100 years tell a story of democracy and dictatorship, whether it is a people in a country advocating for liberty or whether it's a corporation that's lost touch with its consumers and with its employees. The story is the same. Progress and prosperity demand democracy and those rely only on our voices as human beings. Entities such as Groupon, Zulu, uh, Great Harvest Bread, WD40, New Belgium Brewery, all of them democratic institutions that provide not only great employee satisfaction, but also they provide the ability and resilience to make changes as the business climate changes absolutely imperative in a global climate. And they too demand our voices. From the Arab Spring, to Black Lives Matter, to Occupy movements, we have groups of people all over the world protesting beyond the institutions because simply institutions, even social justice institutions, no longer meet the needs of the voice of the people. So what does that call for us to do? Well, first, we have an obligation, an obligation always to use our voices in support of democracy. But right now, we have a critical time in which democracies need to develop 
organizations and communities that are responsive to human voice. How do we do that? Well, the answer, the answer is partially found in first year college students. Their experience shows us a little bit about voice and how to engage our, dem our democracies. Eight years ago, my colleagues and I created a course in civic engagement and public advocacy. In it, students research an issue in their community, looking at the best practices in other communities. They sit down with their community and determine the best way forward and ultimately take action. As a result, transformation in communities, in us as individuals, and for the students. In just one semester, they become empowered citizens, ready, willing, able, even impatient to take on the world and engage with their communities. From them, we can learn a path forward. And it's a worthy path. Alumni surveys show that once a voice is found, it is retained and used again and again and again. So the first step in that path is to find our voices. Civic voice is interesting. When you talk to people who have found civic voice, they talk to you as if it's a religious revival experience. They will tell you a story about how they discovered that they needed to say something about something important to them. Last week, I met a woman who told me that she found her voice when she realized that she had something to say and that she had to say the whole truth about it because she was no longer afraid of the consequences. Diana's story is no different than that of my students. They determined that they had some things to say. Some things worth saying, so worth saying, that they're willing to face down their fears and engage with their communities. That is voice, and it's a common experience. Something to say, truth, and the care enough for it that you're willing to risk. So the elements of voice are clear. Expertise, authenticity, and passion. Where they come together and meet to address a community need, that is voice. Quite simply, it's not complex. You know what, it's not even new. Those are the same principles of credibility, competence, character, and charisma. What's new about it is when we do it in our community with meaning and purpose, we have the ability to uncover our personal voices and transform communities. So how do we do that? Well, the first step is expertise. Expertise makes sense to us. The world is full of unsupported opinion. What we demand from people is we really want to hear someone who's researched it fully, considered all sides, and is speaking for the community, not out of personal benefit. From that expertise comes authenticity, the willingness to tell it like it is. That is the person who can speak truth to power. And of course, at the end, we have to have passion. For our care and concern and community, we get a courage out of which we're willing to take risks. Expertise, authenticity, and passion. That simple. So how do we start? Again, quite easy. It requires only that we engage with our communities, find out the key issues, research them fully, talk to others about them, and form a holistic view about what is best for the community. In fact, you can start today, just like our students. Choose one issue. Research it fully in your community by talking to neighbors and friends and experts and others. From their input and information, form a view of it that essentially looks at community benefit and good. And you know, in doing that one step, you will have easily, and I think in a fun way, engaged with your community. And on that foundation, you can find voice. Martin Luther King had a dream of a participatory multicultural democracy. Mary Fisher blew apart the silence of HIV and AIDS and students are invested and engaged in their communities. All of these people claimed voice, and in doing so, they've opened up a grand and broad space in our democracy that demands that we step into it. And today we can. I ask you, just simply, to take that step into that void 
of what democ democracy calls from us, a voice with expertise, authenticity, and passion. And what we can do from that is transform ourselves and our communities. Thank you.